around 5.3 million years ago, a crucial event reshaped the Mediterranean region. It was a colossal flood that refilled the local sea, which had been extremely barren and salty up until that point. It got the name Zanclean Flood, and it forever changed the geography of the area. The Mediterranean Sea is surrounded by Europe, Africa, and Asia, and connects to the ocean by the Strait of Gibraltar. This is quite a narrow passage, measuring about 8 miles. It may not be that wide, but the strait plays a crucial role in maintaining the liquid balance between these two bodies of water. About 6 million years ago, a bunch of things might have caused the Mediterranean to be cut off from the Atlantic Ocean. Some say it was an ice age. Others speak of tectonic movements, like earthquakes. Whatever the cause, it pushed the Mediterranean area into a period called the Mycidian Salinity Crisis. For about 1,000 years, the sea slowly evaporated, leaving behind a dry basin that was several miles below sea level. This crisis really changed the landscape, creating conditions similar to those found in today's Dead Sea. What this means is that the lush Mediterranean beauty used to be a super salty environment, containing nearly 10 times more salt than the ocean. Say you could have visited you would have been able to effortlessly float on the little water you could find, even if you're not a skilled swimmer. The amount of salt and that mineral content would have made it challenging for most creatures to survive. However, some hardy microorganisms, such as bacteria, could have adapted to these harsh conditions. These days, at the bottom of the Mediterranean Sea, we can find holes as large as the Grand Canyon, and they seem to have formed during that same period of dehydration. Evidence suggests that massive rivers, such as the Nile and the Rhone, flowed directly into the Mediterranean back then, leaving behind canyons as they reached the bottom, thousands of feet below the sea level. People had to find some sort of explanation back in the day for the drying of the Mediterranean, so they came up with myths and legends. One such tale was told by the people of southern Iberia, in modern-day Spain and Portugal. It was also recounted by a famous Roman writer called Pliny the Elder. What this legend said was that the Mediterranean used to be cut out from the ocean until the hero Hercules, with his mighty sword, carved a path. He did so between a fictional location in modern-day Africa and the Rock of Gibraltar. This allowed the ocean waters to flow in, transforming the Mediterranean into what we know today. Some fossils also seem to confirm the unusually large flood, Remains of marine organisms were found in layers high above current sea levels. This means the areas were once submerged underwater. These fossils belong to mollusks, fish, and marine mammals. Because of modern techniques, we now have at least an estimated timing of the Zanclean flood. Scientists used computer simulations to reconstruct the event, providing further evidence that it was real. What they also discovered is that there's a possibility the Mediterranean might change once more. The Strait of Gibraltar could close, most likely because of movements deep under the ground. This could lead to the Mediterranean becoming dry again, over a span of about a thousand years. The Mediterranean area could disappear altogether if the African continent keeps shifting north too, getting closer to Europe. Another one of those famous yet still a bit hypothetical large floods is called the Black Sea Deluge Theory. Some scientists think that around 8,400 years ago, water from the Mediterranean might have spilled over into the Black Sea through a narrow passage called the Bosporus Strait. This could have caused a massive disaster, forcing people living near the Black Sea to pack up their things and move further inside the continent in both Europe and Asia. Along with them, they might have carried stories about this colossal flood. The specialists that came up with this idea also suggested that these migrating people might have brought along new ways of farming. Not everyone from the scientific community is convinced, though. Some argue that while there might have been a flood, it likely happened earlier and was way smaller. They didn't think this flood could have caused, for example, the story of Noah's Ark. In this legend, a spiritual man was warned by a higher entity that a giant flood was on its way. The man went to gather pairs of animals and pack them all in a boat to make sure these species would survive the devastating flood. There was also the concern among scholars that discussing real floods and ancient stories too much might blur the lines between science and fiction. 
There may be other reasons why these flood stories are so often found across different cultures all over our planet. One idea is that floods were incredibly destructive for early farmers, so they invented myths about them signaling the end of the world. Another idea is that people stumbled upon ancient sea creature fossils in unusual places, leading them to believe there was a significant flood in the past. The solution to future floods, though, might be floating cities. As sea levels continue to rise, coastal cities like Amsterdam, New Orleans, and Venice may go under. So, floating infrastructure may be the way to go, with buildings that can rise with the water levels, making them able to resist extreme weather, too. Countries like the Netherlands, which have a history of managing water risks, are pioneering these floating creations. With cities running out of space for expansion, we might be forced to move on water anyway. By moving on the water, we can reduce crowding and create more interesting ways to feed ourselves, like floating gardens. These homes also come with great alternatives to our energy needs through systems that use solar and wind power. Not to mention that these homes might turn out to be cheaper in the long run. One such floating city might pop up soon in the Maldives. Its goal is to host up to 20,000 people and will feature places to live and eat, but also shops and schools. Designed to look like coral, the region will include canals placed between some 5,000 floating pieces of land. The city will be constructed using modular units, put together in a construction site nearby. After they're completed, they'll be towed to the floating city. The next step is to secure them to a large underwater concrete hull, which is screwed tightly to the seabed on some steel stilts. All these pieces of construction let the modular units easily move as naturally as the sea. Even for those that are afraid of seasickness, there's a solution. That's what the nearby coral reef is for. It will surround the city, making a natural wave breaker. Human-made coral banks will also be placed underneath the city, which will also help coral grow naturally. The long-term goal is to make the establishment self-sufficient. It will have electricity, mostly from on-site solar power. Waste will be treated nearby and reused as plant fertilizer. Instead of air conditioning, the city will use deep-sea water cooling. This method pumps cold water from the deep sea to cool the area, saving energy. Earth is not the only planet that's seen some serious floods. In ancient times, Mars seems to have experienced them too, and they played an important role in shaping its surface. Recent research reveals that billions of years ago, Mars was heavily affected by some serious river flooding which contributed to the formation of its valleys and canyons. The reason for these floods was heavy rainfall, which reshaped the Martian landscape in a jiffy, at times even within days or weeks. Unlike Earth, where rivers form pretty slowly, Mars experienced rapid changes because of these floods, particularly around 4 billion years ago. We've known for quite some time that there have been floods on Mars, but this study really showed us their extent. We now know they were more widespread and frequent than previously thought. Ah, the desert welcomes you with challenging conditions of abandoned environments and extreme temperatures. Hey, some of us would prefer dessert, chocolate over sand and rocks. Oh well, just like cactuses and camels, buildings have had to adapt to these conditions. Here are some examples of astonishing structures in deserts. These structures are called earthships. They're located in a New Mexico desert town. A large community of like-minded people lives in them. What's even more interesting is that the location of these buildings is registered as dumpsters. Maybe it's because all these structures are made out of old tires, bottles, and cans. Earthships operate using green building principles. About 40% of a typical earthship is built with natural or recycled materials. Imagine the walls made up of hundreds of used tires packed with dirt. Then there are layers of floor-to-ceiling passive solar windows. They gather the sunlight during winter and reflect it in the summer to keep the structures at a reasonable room temperature. You can see plants in corridors and glass bottles or aluminum cans stuffed inside walls. Certainly a distinct house in many ways. Mike Reynolds is an architect who noticed the alarming waste and consumption levels in the 1970s. He designed a fully sustainable home out of cans back then. Almost 40 years later, he becomes the one who brings together all the other earth shippers. Reynolds drove a Mercedes, but it ran off of the vegetable oil he picked up at fast food restaurants in town. 
A standard two-bedroom, two-bathroom Earthship costs about $250,000 in this town. Yet there are Earthships, like Dobson House, that can cost as much as $1.5 million. If you do it yourself, you know, with family and friends, you can eliminate the cost of labor, and it becomes relatively less expensive. Let's assume you're really going to build one. Where can it be? Well, anywhere. Earthships currently fit in the cold, dry air of Canada, as well as the hot and humid climate of Haiti. This is the Mirage Mirror House. It's an installation set in the Southern California desert. Mirage opened in 2017 as part of a contemporary art exhibition. It's composed of mirrors. This minimalistic structure blends with the environment around it. The doors, windows, and openings have been removed to create an amazing experience. What you have in the landscape is reflected back to you. How's it made? With mirrored surfaces. At night, the distant lights refract from the mirrors. In the daytime, the sky is transformed into banks of clouds. There's no fixed scenery in this house. How about seeing a futuristic structure in the deep desert? Architects designed a concept home that pairs perfectly with Elon Musk's Cybertruck. The house has a post-apocalyptic theme. I mean, when I say post-apocalyptic, it's because I can't say it. Anyway, the house is designed to survive in a disaster scenario. The cyber house has steel gates, the windows are armored, and the exterior walls are made out of super strong material. Modern house is controlled by an autonomous geothermal heat pump. To put it in less sci-fi terms, you can keep the internal temperature steady. This sleek house has an entrance that can fit the Cybertruck. After all, it's inspired by it in the first place. Plus, the Cybertruck can be lifted to the second floor to be more secure. This is King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center in Saudi Arabia. Basically, it's a laboratory in a desert. It was designed to demand minimum energy. The architecture has patterns on the walls and ceilings, giving reference to the local tradition of geometric form. The next stop is Swartberg House in South Africa. This one is located near the Swartberg Mountains, but don't get too excited. It's on the edge of the Great Karoo Desert. It's a four-bedroom apartment. It has a special temperature regulating system. The system works like a shield from the heat in the summer and has a sun trap in the winter. You're looking at the Grand Mosque of Jene in Mali. This mosque is 52 feet tall. This is impressive because it's made of only sticks and a special mix of mud and other natural elements found in the desert. Petra is an ancient city hidden in the Jordan Desert. The structures are carved directly into red, white, and pink colored sandstone cliff faces. It's located among the canyons and mountains near the desert. The place was a trade center many, many years ago. You might already see pictures of the impressive facade of the treasury. This structure still holds many mysteries in it. For starters, scientists can't explain how the Nabataeans managed to create such a structure thousands of years ago. Did you know that there's another mysterious place in the middle of the desert that has a similar structure to Petra? Medayan Saleh was like a second capital of the Nabataean kingdom. Yet another secret they left for us to decipher. It has over 100 decorated tombs and more than a thousand non-monumental graves. Plus, inscriptions and cave drawings are also here, again surrounded by sandstone. This wooden shack was a post office once. The structure is in the Tengar Desert of Mongolia. It's surrounded by mm, nothing. Sand is the only thing that accompanies the lonely structure. The building is only 23 square inches. As you can guess, it didn't get too many visitors. It was abandoned for over 35 years. Its fate changed one day when a woman discovered the building. Mrs. Zhang and her friend came up with an idea. They were going to reach businesses and people who wanted to send letters and postcards from the world's loneliest post office without actually visiting the place. It worked. The post office rarely gets visitors in place, but it's busy online. Over 20,000 letters and postcards were sent from the desert post office in December 2021 alone. The place is about 6 miles off the nearest road. A post truck picks the letters up and hits the road for delivery. Eventually, they are shipped all over the world. A second destination in Saudi Arabia is King Abdulaziz Center for World Culture. The building has an interesting design. It took nearly a decade to build this complex structure. It's a 321-foot-tall tower which stands out with its look. Stone Matters Pavilion is a stone structure in Palestine. The structure spans a surface area of 93 square inches. 
It has been built entirely out of 300 interlocking stones that mutually support each other. The concave roofs, and yes, they look like giant bowls, are designed that way to collect rainwater. The structure is in Iran. Interestingly, in Iran, the evaporation rate is three times faster than the world average, so this bowl-like design comes in very handy. It captures the water in a way that the water can form a single mass as a whole before it evaporates. The outer shell of the roof system collects rainwater, but it also works as an additional shading. It makes air move freely, designed like a cooling mechanism for both roofs. Eco Lodge in Egypt is the next stop. The project is built in a place that overlooks the desert and is constructed using locally available materials like sun-fired bricks and palm wood. The building is an example of traditional architecture. There's a water basin that lets in the air to keep the interior cool. A worthy mention is the CID Interpretation Center in Chile. Chile's Atacama Desert is among the top tourist destinations in the country. To help the tourists, architects designed a visitor's center as part of the infrastructure for the wind farm. Here, the cold winter months don't freeze people because the large windows make the most of solar heating. What's even more interesting is that the building is designed to go completely dark at night. Imagine you somehow bumped into the building by accident. Black Desert House is a building respecting the stars. At night, this house goes completely dark. It dissolves into the night, so the stars can appear more prominent. Now, any mysterious desert buildings you know that aren't on this list? Let us know in the comments. You find yourself in Africa land of unique wildlife, home to a great variety of cultures and languages, and, first and foremost, host to the world's largest hot desert, the Sahara. It's daytime, and you are thirsty for some water and shade. You've been walking for days, trying to find one of those precious-looking oases. You feel you're near, but the horizon just keeps stretching and stretching. Your mind is tired, and your body is feeling all the heat. It's like you've eaten a full plate of hot pepper and then some more, judging by how much you're sweating. And when I say hot, think 100 degrees Fahrenheit hot on average. No wonder this is happening. After all, you find yourself in the world's biggest hot desert. Now I say hot desert since the biggest deserted landscapes are actually the cold ones, located in Antarctica and the Arctic. I see Antarctica's frozen desert is more or less the size of 1 million LAXs. Yep, the Los Angeles International Airport. The Arctic Desert is just a bit smaller than that. Now, in case you don't know, the Sahara Desert is located in northern Africa, stretching from the Atlantic Ocean all the way over to the Red Sea. It occupies an area large enough to place approximately 100,000 Disney World theme parks side by side. According to scientists, its boundaries are expanding. Deserts usually form in the subtropics because of what's called Hadley circulation. The air rises at the equator and descends into the subtropics. This circulation of air has a drying effect, which helps the formation of desert landscapes. Since the 1920s, the Sahara is considered to have expanded by over 10%. How is this happening? Well, let's start from the beginning. You probably know the Sahara Desert as one of the most inhospitable places on Earth today. Just FYI, for a place to be considered a desert, it has to receive less than 4 inches of rain per year. Due to the very small precipitation index, deserts are usually dry and arid places. There is little humidity in the air, and daytime temperatures can go as high as 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Usually, there isn't that much animal and plant life because of the lack of water. But in the Sahara's case, it wasn't always like that. It may be difficult to imagine northern Africa without the tons of sand it has today. But about 20,000 years ago, the Sahara was actually one big oasis. Recent discoveries show clear evidence of what the scientists now call the Green Sahara. In the mid-1800s, a German explorer crossing the Sahara encountered some paintings and engravings that nomad artists had left behind. What he saw in those paintings looked nothing like his actual surroundings. Instead of an arid landscape with only camels and desert vegetation, the rock paintings depicted jungle animals like giraffes and hippos. There were even images of livestock and grazing animals, such as cattle and sheep, something that seems impossible for modern-day Sahara. Artists usually draw what they see around them, 
So this finding really intrigued the German explorer. The drawings were so detailed that the artist must have had close contact with those animals. You can find this rock art spread out in the northern part of the African continent, from Western Sahara to Saudi Arabia. Geologists soon took a keen interest in this and found the first clues to what this could mean. They have been able to confirm that, in fact, northern Africa was once much wetter. They found evidence from nearby deep sea sediment off the coast of Mauritania. Sample cores of underwater sand and mud, known as Saharan dust flux, show geologists that, indeed, a green Sahara was possible. The more dust is blowing off of the desert and into the bottom of the ocean, the drier the climate in the region. The sediment cores show that there was much less dust, only half as much, coming off northern Africa during the humid period. This period has to do with Earth's natural cycles. Normally, the Earth rotates at a tilt of 23.5 degrees. But this angle is not consistent and changes over time. Earth's tilt is responsible for the amount of sunlight each hemisphere receives. It affects several ecosystem functions on the planet. During the time of the Green Sahara, the Earth received between 4 and 8% more sunlight than it does today. So when the Earth tilted about 20,000 years ago, the northern hemisphere received more direct sunlight, which affected humidity levels in the region. As the northern hemisphere got warmer, this affected monsoon activity. More specifically, the West African monsoon. Monsoons are wind systems that affect a region's rainfall index and humidity levels. As a part of the globe gets warmer, it allows for more air to rise. It combines with the wind to draw moisture up into the atmosphere. Little by little, northern Africa also became wetter. The increased moisture made the Sahara so wet that there were actual bodies of water in the region. As vegetation grew, the plants held on to moisture better than bare sand could. There is evidence of natural basins throughout the Sahara and lakes so big they would fit all of the U.S.'s Great Lakes inside of them. Archaeologists uncovered evidence of vibrant societies in what are now arid areas. It looks like ancient cultures were able to take full advantage of the African humid period. According to researchers, the human population peaked across the Sahara about 9,000 years ago. There are traces of fireplaces, hunting tools, fish hooks, and even mounds of fish bones. Records show that there have been over 230 green periods over the span of 8 million years. Solar radiation is always changing due to natural orbital cycles. That's why Earth will most certainly see another green Sahara moment. It might be thousands of years from now, but it will happen. The same way the Sahara turns green, it turns yellow again. Let's put it like that. All it takes is a significant axial tilt and a few years of readjusting. However, another phenomenon is calling the attention of scientists now. Recent studies by the National Science Foundation from the University of Maryland show the Sahara has expanded 10% over the past 90 years. This phenomenon is called desertification, which literally means fertile land turning into desert land. The Sahara Desert is now advancing into the semi-arid region of Sahel. In 1950, this region was home to 31 million people. Today, its population is over 100 million people. This rapid population growth has largely contributed to the Sahara's expansion. Farmers that were once nomads began settling down. Land usage grew more intense, aiding in weakening the soil. The demand for food has caused an overcropping of the land, so even more of it is turning into the desert now. The study also shows that natural climate cycles can affect rainfall in the Sahara and the Sahel. Scientists affirm that all deserts fluctuate, not only the Sahara. A desert's boundary may expand in the dry winter and contract during the wetter summer. South of the Sahara lies the Chad Basin. It is a natural body of water that now serves as an indicator of the Sahara's expansion. The Chad Basin is located in the region where the Sahara is advancing southward. An atmospheric and ocean expert from the University of Maryland explains that rainfall has reduced greatly in the entire region. Due to reduced rainfalls, there is less water across the entire basin, and even Chad Lake is drying out. Just like the Sahara, the Atacama Desert in Chile, deemed the world's driest, is also expanding. It is located north of the city of Santiago, 
and its southern border is expanding toward the Chilean capital. Because the climate is getting drier and drier here, the city of Santiago is turning into an arid or semi-arid region itself. The once fertile valleys of local rivers that lived on agriculture and livestock for many generations are losing their revenues as Chilean land is turning into a desert. Since 2010, Santiago has received only a third of its annual rainfall. Outside of the city, farmers are digging holes in search of blue gold, or simply put, water. The situation here is very similar to that of Sahel. So tell me this. Were you as surprised as I was to find out what has been happening in the Sahara region? Feel free to share in the comments below. So the Sahara Desert is so big that it covers 8% of the world's territory. It's bigger than the USA or China. Surprisingly, the Sahara is not the largest desert in the world. It is the third largest, behind Antarctica and the Arctic. But it is definitely the hottest one. Temperatures there reach 136 degrees Fahrenheit. This place has some of the most incredible sand dunes you've ever seen, towering up to 1,476 feet. But here's the kicker. There's a real risk that these dunes might continue to spread until they cover the entire world. Surprisingly, the influence of the Sahara Desert extends far beyond its borders. Its dust, carried by powerful winds, makes its way to the UK and across the European continent, particularly in winter. This dust settling on the ground where it rains is a familiar sight to those in the UK, often leaving a red residue on cars. This connection between the Sahara, England, and Europe serves as a stark reminder of the global reach of environmental phenomena. You might think this is not a big deal, but it could turn Europe into a desert leaving its soil infertile and Europeans with no food. Soil is a fundamental aspect of human existence, just as crucial as clean water and air. Without it, we're left with nothing but a bleak and barren landscape. The Sahara Desert has already made its jump across the Mediterranean Sea, which is concerning and could change the landscape forever. One-fifth of Spain has already turned into a desert. The next victim is Italy, which also faces the problem of desertification. In fact, almost all European countries have the same issue. According to an expert, the land that has not changed for nearly 2,000 years will become mostly rock, and people living on this land will be gone. 60% of the soil in Moldova is gone, and the problem has expanded beyond the Black Sea. It has reached China and Mongolia, thousands of miles away from the Sahara Desert. All of this causes losses of $4 billion a year. The threat is so significant that even the UN has gathered the necessary resources to solve the problem as soon as possible. Italy is sending help to Africa to stop the Sahara Desert from expanding. If this process does not stop in the next 10 years, millions will be forced to leave their homes. The Sahara Desert is growing for approximately 30 miles per decade. You do the math and see how long it will take to cover Europe. Since 1920, the Sahara has expanded by around 10%. But not all hope is lost because more than 172 countries have joined to put a stop to the desertification of the world. The World Food Program is a project that aims to help bring back green land that was once present in the Sahara. When they told people who called the Sahara home what they were about to do, the latter basically laughed in their faces and said it was impossible. But when you have a specific goal in mind, the impossible becomes possible. If we traveled back around 5,000 years into the past, we would see a beautiful forest with lush green trees and grass. Africa's climate has been changing for 21,000 years, from fantastic greenery to uninhabitable deserts. This has to do with Earth's rotation and the monsoons that bring water to this dry continent. But with the help of scientists and some clever tricks, we can bring the greenery back and stop the Sahara in its tracks. The Senegal River serves as a border between the Sahara Desert, Senegal City, and Mauritania. When you look at this area from space, you'll see how the desert is expanding to Senegal because the vegetation along the riverbank is almost non-existent. 
Forests can serve as a barrier, stopping the sand from getting blown away and the desert from expanding. An effort to create a great green wall is being made, and how they do it is actually quite impressive. Nothing has been growing in the currently restored area for more than 40 years, making locals find other places to call home. People were thrilled when they saw that the land could be restored. They're very committed and learn to work with the soil and grow food. At the same moment, more than 30,000 hectares have been restored and transformed into lush greenery. The Sahel region is the starting point of desertification, and it is crucial to establish a green wall in that area first. To make this wall is not rocket science, since it only takes a few simple steps. The ground there is baked by the sun and as hard as a block of concrete. If you've ever poured water on concrete, you know that it just flows away. It doesn't stay in one place. So they had to create water-retaining half-moons that would hold the water and make it available to plants. When you learn about how these half-moons work, you might say, how did they not think of that sooner? Actually, this technique is ancient, and it was once implemented in Sahel, but it was lost over time. When the rain falls, the water is collected into the half-moons that are positioned a bit lower than the ground below contour lines. There is also a kind of bank at the end of the shape that prevents water from overflowing. And in the middle, there are plants that are happy because they have plenty of water to thrive. Also. These plants are for and produce a good mass, which means the land can be rehabilitated faster and people will have food sooner. The water that will enter the half moons won't be lost. It will penetrate the ground and top off underground waters. This will ensure the ground that H2O will never run out and that future generations will have usable aqua. This brilliant planting technique is not limited to half moons. People also create lines and plant various vegetables, such as tomatoes. Next, there are places only for trees, like lemons or oranges. After a long, hot day, nothing is better than a freshly made cold lemonade. The trees will also protect the soil, and with some luck, there will be a new forest in the Sahara Desert. The goal is to copy the forest dynamic, start with small plants, and gradually expand to bigger plants that are more useful than the tiny ones. They are aiming to plant more than 10,000 trees. Right now, many people are leaving the Sahara after the rainy season, going to cities or leaving Africa altogether. At this time of year, villages are like ghost towns. Only animals can be found there. Most people are gone. I mean, who would blame them? Nobody wants to live in the sand where nothing grows. Luckily, with all this new, old technology being developed, many people are slowly but surely returning to their land and starting to work in agriculture. The best thing is that there are no brutal winters, so plants grow 12 months a year, and people can always have food. People are becoming more social because now everybody stays in their villages and doesn't travel much. If this project works out, Africa will be saved and the world won't turn into a giant desert. We've all heard of the Sahara. Sure you have. It's the largest hot desert on the planet. A sea of sand covering an area larger than the contiguous United States. But have you ever wondered what lies beneath the sand dunes? To answer this question, we must travel deep into the past of our blue planet. Up until some 6,000 years ago, the Sahara was grassland. Humans were around at this time, not me, spreading agriculture around the planet. In the north of Africa, the color green dominated. Plenty of rainfall meant that there were lakes, rivers, pastures, and even forests. A completely different image of the Sahara from the barren landscape of today. But then, the climate started to shift. The region became parched, and the vegetation started disappearing. The wind did the rest. It took away the fine sediment after there were no plant roots to hold the ground together. Give it a couple thousands of years, and you get a familiar image of the Sahara. Sand and rocks stretching as far as the eye can see. But when it comes to volume, only a quarter of the Sahara is actually sand. 
The yellow sands of the Sahara are just one part of the story. The desert has many other features, such as gravel plains, salt flats, and plateaus. Makes you think if we understand the word desert correctly. For people who study such terrains, geologists, there is only one condition for defining a desert – precipitation. If an area gets little or no rain, then it's considered a desert. The Sahara certainly fits the bill. Its average annual rainfall is just 3 inches. Compare that to the nearly 45 inches a year in New York. When we look at precipitation, this sandy desert is only the third largest in the world. Number 1 and 2 are Antarctica and the Arctic. They are larger than the Sahara by millions of square miles. It sounds odd, but there is more than one type of desert. The first two are polar deserts, while the Sahara is a subtropical desert. But the difference in air temperature are staggering. In Antarctica's interior, temperatures plummet to minus 76 degrees Fahrenheit. Compare that to the highest temperature on record in the Sahara of 136 degrees Fahrenheit. But this desert has a cool side. At night, the temperature is roughly the same as the average yearly temperature in Denmark. This hot and cold roller coaster makes it hard to choose the right outfit when venturing into the Sahara. And what about the sand? How deep is it actually? The depth varies between 70 and 140 feet. That's not too deep. If you put the Statue of Liberty in a tall dune, half of it would still stick out of the sand. Its vast amounts in the Sahara were created by aeolian processes. That's Greek for wind. Over time, it blows and shapes the surface of the Earth. In dry areas with sparse vegetation, winds erode the ground much faster. That's what happened in North Africa. Under all that sand is the bedrock and cracked clay. If you started digging, you would find the same everywhere on the planet, with one important difference. There is some type of soil covering the bedrock. This is not the case in the Sahara. Because of the arid climate and a lack of vegetation, sand covers the ground below. Over the course of thousands of years, a lot of interesting finds ended up in the desert sand. For example, there are petrified tree trunks. These are essentially preserved prehistoric trees. They date back to the time when the region was lush green. In some places, the trees of this fossilized forest are at least 65 feet tall. The wood is so well preserved that you can still see the texture and knots. There are even fossilized pine cones. In 1992, scientists found glass fragments in eastern Sahara. These canary yellow glass shards were scattered across hundreds of miles. They didn't belong to an ancient civilization, although ancient Egyptians used them to make jewelry. In fact, the breastplate of King Tut had a beautiful scarab beetle centerpiece made from this desert glass. For a long time, scientists were puzzled about the true origins of these fragments. They finally concluded that the glass was around 29 million years old. It is an impact type. If that sounds like it has something to do with the word impact, you are correct. These rocks are formed when a meteorite hits the surface of the Earth. This generates a lot of heat. Scientists estimate that the temperature needed to melt this mineral was close to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Apart from the regular fine-grained sand, we also have melted sand in the Sahara. But the desert conceals other unlikely artifacts. Shark teeth are a common find in Morocco, which sits in the western part of the Sahara. What are the fossilized teeth of these marine predators doing in the middle of the desert? This part of the world looked entirely different millions of years ago. There was a sea cutting right through what is now a desert. The Trans-Saharan Seaway ran the length of present-day Algeria and Mali. It was around 165 feet deep. That was enough for all sorts of aquatic animals to inhabit it. Large catfish, sea snakes, and of course sharks lived in the area. British archaeologists even unearthed a turtle shell in Mali in the 1980s. For centuries, there was even an entire city hidden under the desert. Timgad was a Roman outpost constructed by the Emperor Trajan around the year 100 in the current era. For various reasons, its residents abandoned it around the year 700. The sands of the Sahara soon engulfed the city. 
It had remained hidden for nearly a thousand years. Then, in the 1700s, a Scottish explorer started digging out the city. His team first uncovered a sandstone triumphal arch 40 feet high, similar to the ones we can see in Rome and Paris today. An amphitheater soon popped out of the sand, and it was followed by well-preserved statues of Roman emperors. The Scotsman's find was so impressive that no one believed him at first. It took two more centuries for archaeologists to fully excavate the city during the 1950s. The site covers a surface as large as 10 polo fields. The ruins reveal the full mastery of Roman city planning. All the streets meet at a right angle, in what is known as an orthogonal grid. You can find the same layout in modern cities such as New York. Historians estimate that during its heyday, 10,000 people called Timgad home. Different nationalities lived here, from Romans to people of African descent. Today, more than 2.5 million people live in and around the Sahara. They are spread across 11 countries in total, and their living space is growing. The desert is 10% larger than it was just a century ago. This process doesn't involve sand pouring out of the Sahara. The ecosystems on the edges of the desert simply change over time. The wind blows the soil away and vegetation dwindles – the perfect conditions for the formation of a desert landscape. These changes are happening in the Sahel, a region south of the Sahara Desert. That's why the African countries have recently come together for a project called the Great Green Wall. The primary goal is to stop the desertification of the Sahel and hold back the sands of the Sahara. Their plan is ambitious and involves planting a wall of trees from the west to the east of the African continent. The proposed forest is not only going to be long, but wide as well. The Sahara and the Sahel share a historic bond. Since antiquity, camel caravans have been making the journey from Africa's Mediterranean coast in the north to the savannas in the south. The golden age of this trade kicked off in the 9th century. The perilous journey took several months to complete. The route was two and a half times longer than the length of the Grand Canyon. Explorers still find evidence of these ancient caravans hidden away under the sands of the Sahara. In November 1922, a boy walked through the desert mountains of Egypt and discovered some ancient steps carved into the rock. Subsequently, this find became one of the world's largest and most significant archaeological discoveries. This step was part of Tutankhamun's untouched tomb. Archaeologists found about 5,000 ancient objects, including jewelry, fabrics, painted vases, and funeral masks. You've probably seen one of them. It has become one of the most recognizable attributes of ancient Egypt. More than a hundred years have passed since then. And now, humanity has finally become close to another large-scale discovery, the tomb of Cleopatra. This queen was the last active ruler of the Ptolemaic Kingdom of Egypt, who sat on the throne from 51 to 30 BCE. There are many ancient records about Cleopatra, her reign, and her unusual personality. But until now, no one has discovered the secrets about her passing away in the burial place. So, one archaeologist, Dr. Kathleen Martinez, has been studying ancient records and temples around Alexandria for decades and concluded that the tomb of the queen should be located under the ancient city of Taposiris Magna, founded in 280 BCE. It was a big city on the northern coast of Egypt where tens of thousands of people were engaged in trade and industry. And it seems that Dr. Martinez's guesses turned out to be correct. She and a group of archaeologists have discovered a secret underground tunnel near Alexandria with a length of about 0.8 miles. It was cut into the rock under Taposiris Magna's temple. During further excavations, they found many things that indicate Cleopatra's tomb lies in the tunnel's depths. It's also possible that she is buried there together with the Roman commander, Mark Antony. According to ancient records, Cleopatra and Mark Antony loved each other and together opposed the Roman Senate which declared Antony a traitor. The fact that natural disasters have occurred on the territory of Taposiris Magna for thousands of years can complicate the excavations. 
Earthquakes and floods destroyed the city and possibly flooded its underground tunnels. But archaeologists hope the ancient tomb remains untouched and that it hides many treasures and records about the royal life of ancient Egypt during the reign of the last dynasty. There's a chance that excavations will go underwater and in the mud. This will require much time and funding, but archaeologists are sure it's worth it. Anyway, it's too early to say that Cleopatra is really buried there. But scientists have found many things in the tunnel that confirm this, including clay pots, dozens of coins with the image of Cleopatra and Alexander the Great, as well as a bust with the image of the Egyptian queen. Cleopatra is still one of the most popular personalities in Egypt, on an equal footing with Rameses III and Tutankhamun. She inspired many films, paintings, and books. But what made her so popular? She became famous for her inconsistency. She was a beautiful, intelligent ruler who pulled Egypt out of the crisis and made it a prosperous power. Medieval Arabic texts say she knew chemistry, mathematics, and philosophy, and may have written several scientific books. She knew several languages and had excellent diplomatic skills. At the same time, there are many legends that she was a femme fatale who drove many men crazy. However, there's no evidence that her beauty was incomparable. The image of a stunning model was created by Hollywood when it made several films where famous actresses performed the role of Cleopatra. And the Roman Emperor Octavian, the adopted son of Julius Caesar, specially created the image of Cleopatra as an insidious seductress because he was her enemy. Even though she was born in Egypt, Cleopatra wasn't an Egyptian. Her ancestors were Greeks, among whom was one of the generals of Alexander the Great. However, the people of Egypt loved her. She learned the language and was very sensitive to the traditions of this country. She knew the history, mentality, and customs of ancient Egypt well. She raised the level of its economy and strengthened its status as a world power. Much of this was made possible thanks to her cunning and impressiveness. She loved theatrical performances and lavish celebrations. She knew how to surprise people and put on a show. But behind the exterior image of a luxury lover was an intelligent and calculating ruler. Ancient Egypt was a rich, luxurious country and Cleopatra did everything to increase its wealth and strengthen its position in the international arena. For example, she was once in conflict with her brother Ptolemy XIII Odd. The queen knew that she wouldn't be able to resist him, so she decided to attract Julius Caesar to their side. The Roman Emperor arrived in Alexandria, where Cleopatra wanted to meet him, but Ptolemy knew about her plans and was about to prevent her from coming to Caesar. Then. Instead of a rich and noisy arrival, Cleopatra decided to make her visit inconspicuous. She wrapped herself in a carpet or linen bag the emperor's servants carried into Caesar's private chambers. Cleopatra emerged from the carpet and impressed the Roman emperor with her beauty and determination. As a result, they fell in love with each other and became close allies. After some time, she impressed another influential Roman for diplomatic purposes. She arrived to meet Mark Antony on a golden barge with purple sails and silver oars. Cleopatra was dressed in the image of Aphrodite and sat under a magnificent canopy. Her servants dressed like cupids and were blowing her fan and burning incense. But Cleopatra created such a show for a reason. She knew that Antony revered Greek mythology and considered himself the embodiment of Dionysus. As a result, he was so impressed with this woman that he ended up marrying her. Cleopatra defended her crown, strengthened her alliance with Rome, and bore Antony three children. In Egypt, they threw big parties and enjoyed wealth with power. However, the relationship of a high-ranking official with the Egyptian queen caused a scandal in Rome. Octavian was Antony's primary opponent in the struggle for power, so he exploited the situation to darken the competitor's reputation. He used propaganda to make Cleopatra an insidious seductress in the eyes of Roman citizens. He accused Antony of succumbing to her charms. The Roman Senate supported Octavian and declared Cleopatra an enemy. In 33 BCE, this conflict reached a high point when Antony's navy clashed with Octavian's fleet. The latter won and forced his enemy to flee to Egypt with Cleopatra. According to some records, they took refuge near Alexandria, pursued by the Romans. They hid in one of Cleopatra's palaces and met their end. 
Some legends say that Cleopatra was an expert in poisons. She provoked a venomous snake, a viper, or an Egyptian cobra to bite her. Also, according to another legend, she pricked herself with a poisonous needle. There's a theory that Cleopatra always carried an ampule with poison inside her hairbrush. And when she was cornered, she soaked the needle with this poison and pricked herself. None of this can be said for sure. Scientists are still trying to find out the truth. Perhaps when they reach Cleopatra's tomb, the world will get more answers about her tragic fate. She is considered the last ruler of Egypt. After her passing, Octavian plundered her palaces and temples and returned to Rome, where he became the main emperor. He successfully ruled the country and expanded its borders. His reign ended when he turned 75. World history would have looked different if Cleopatra and Mark Antony hadn't lost that naval battle. By the way, did you know that more time has passed between Cleopatra's reign and Neil Armstrong's flight to the moon than between the reign of the Egyptian queen and the construction of the Great Pyramid of Giza? Armstrong took a step on the Earth's satellite in 1969, 2038 years after the birth of Cleopatra. And the construction of the pyramid took place in 2560 BCE. Imagine how long the history of ancient Egypt is. Cleopatra is closer to us in time than to the pyramids. Under the burning sun, among the sand dunes, somewhere in the Sahara Desert, you're walking in search of an ancient treasure. Finally, you find a strange rock in the sand. It's big, looks like a large piece of black coal or rock, but something shiny on its surface makes the rock unusual. This unique find is the oldest thing that has ever been discovered on our planet. This rock was born long before Earth appeared in outer space. The unusual meteorite was found in 2020, in a remote area of the Sahara Desert. Scientists have analyzed the isotopes of magnesium and aluminum on the stone's surface and found that its age is about 4.5 billion years. At the moment, this is the oldest sample of magma from space in history. It belongs to a small protoplanet that didn't have time to form completely. It happened a very long time ago when our solar system was forming. Many huge asteroids were floating in space. Some of them were formed into huge celestial bodies, which later became planets. The big rocky planets were absorbing the smaller ones. The rock was part of a little protoplanet that just began its formation, but another huge asteroid destroyed it. The planet shattered into billions of pieces. Some of them became part of other planets. Some flew outside the solar system and one piece that had been wandering in space until our Earth was formed. After that, it hit the planet's atmosphere and fell into the territory now known as the Sahara Desert. The rock was discovered in 2020, but the erosion of extraterrestrial rocks shows that it could have fallen much earlier. This ancient thing weighing around 70 pounds has several pieces of different meteorites inside. In simple words, it's a volcanic rock consisting of lava. It has cooled, solidified, and crystallized. That's why you notice the glitter. Scientists hope that further study of the rock will help to learn more about our solar system foundation. The biggest asteroid discovered in the U.S. is the Willamette. Its size is 84 square feet, and its weight is more than 15 tons. This is half the weight of a bus. Several people can fit on the surface of this outer space object. But the coolest thing is that it's not a rock like most meteorites that were found. Willamette is made of nickel and iron. This massive piece of metal was discovered in 1906. Now the huge rock is kept at the American Museum of Natural History. The largest meteorite ever found is Hoba. It's located in Namibia, and people have never changed its position because it's too heavy. The weight of Hoba is 60 tons. It's heavier than a tank. The next space-related event occurred on February 28 in southwest England. On this day, a huge flash lit up the sky. Then there was a loud crash. Several residents opened the doors of their houses and noticed a black sooty spot on the lawn. They immediately guessed what had happened and reported the discovery to the British Meteorite Observation Network. If you ever find a meteorite, report it to some geological research or space center as soon as possible. The longer a space rock lies on the ground, the faster it loses its value. Rain, dust, snow, wind, scorching sun, all these factors damage the surface of the meteorite. It makes it difficult to study the celestial object. 
The meteorite found in England looks like coal, but it's way softer and more fragile. It most likely used to contain frozen water. The rock is part of a huge asteroid that plowed through outer space when our solar system hadn't fully formed yet. They found a unique combination of minerals inside the rock. It can help scientists learn more about the origins of the solar system and life on Earth. Now we're heading to Germany, to the small town of Nördlingen. A huge ancient meteorite's hidden here. It's very difficult to notice it unless you know the secret of this town. You're walking along the cozy little streets and looking at the buildings with beautiful architecture. You spend the whole day there and don't find anything that reminds you of a meteorite. To solve the mystery, you need to get out of town. So you climb a high hill and see that the city is located inside a pit. For a long time, locals were sure the house was located in the crater of an extinct volcano. If you look at the houses from a certain angle, you may notice an unusual shining coming from them. In the middle of the 20th century, a group of geologists came here and immediately declared that the crater doesn't look like a volcanic one. The town was built on a huge crater left by a meteorite. The huge celestial body fell here about 15 million years ago. It was so hot that the carbon bubbles inside instantly turned into small diamonds. When people were building this city, they didn't know they were using expensive stones, since the diamonds were hardly visible. The locals never attached importance to the fact that the city walls shine unusually in the sun. Now they believe this place was built from diamonds that had fallen from the sky. Our next stop is in the UK again. This time, the rocks are of an earthly origin. The famous Stonehenge. People place circles of rocks here in a certain order. Everyone knows about this archaeological monument, but no one knows the reason for its creation for certain. Another construction built out of mysterious rocks was discovered just two miles away. It's called Superhenge. It's bigger, heavier, and takes up more space. Each plate here is 15 feet, which is about the height of two floors. Once, the stone stood vertically and formed a huge semicircle. But someone pushed the stones over about 4,500 years ago. It was a college prank. No, not really. That's why they couldn't be detected for a long time. Scientists still can't solve the mystery of Superhenge, but they believe the standing vertical stones were part of some huge monument. Some other amazing rocks are located in the south of Costa Rica. There are big ones the size of a human, and there are smaller ones the size of bowling balls. And they all have a perfectly round shape. These giant rocky spheres were created by people. It must have taken years of polishing using stone tools to get the perfect round shape. These balls are incredibly heavy, but can easily roll like a basketball. All the rocks are of a different age. Some of them were created about 2,500 years ago. Most of them are made of molten volcanic magma. Until now, scientists don't know for what purpose these stones were used. They were found in different parts of Costa Rica, near big cities. It's possible that ancient civilizations installed them specifically to show the greatness of local kings. Also, many experts believe the rocks were used as a tool for studying astronomy. The people who knew their purpose of the rocks had disappeared, and the history of the stones was lost along with them. Let's finish our journey with the coolest archaeological find. You're walking through the desert of Peru and climbing a low hill. You look down and notice the surface of the hill is covered with strange lines. You walk far away and see a huge cat on the hill. Such a drawing is called a geoglyph. Its length is around 120 feet which is about half the size of a Boeing commercial jet. Archaeologists discovered the giant cat in 2020 and found out that it had been created somewhere between 200 and 100 BCE. This huge drawing is part of a mysterious group of different pictures. In addition to the cat, there are other animals, plants, and fantastic figures. All of them were found in the desert of Peru. The kitten was found by chance. Archaeologists didn't see it at first, because natural erosion on the hillside had almost erased the silhouette. Endless hot deserts seem lifeless at first glance. But among these sands, you can meet dangerous and sometimes creepy creatures. 
Some of them can only cause health problems, but some can stay in your memory forever. Let's get to know them, starting with dangerous ones and finishing with real nightmares. So, you're walking through a desert and see a big teddy bear with open hands. You understand that it's probably a mirage, but still, you come closer. You were right. It's not a plush toy, but a giant cactus. There's something strange about it. Thanks to some strange fluff, the branches resemble the arms of a teddy bear. However, this is not fluff, but thousands of thin needles, and they are the reason you shouldn't come closer. The cactus is called the Jumping Choya, or Teddy Bear Choya. It grows in the desert areas of Arizona and in the northern part of Mexico. Don't worry, this cactus won't attack you, but it will cling to your skin or clothes if you touch it. Such a fur coat protects the cactus from animals, creates shade, and saves it from heat. The lateral branches are the most important parts of the plant as they carry out photosynthesis and accumulate a large amount of moisture inside. So, despite all the danger, the cactus can be helpful for desert wanderers. And the danger here is needles. If you look closer at them, you will see they have the shape of hooks. One touch, and hundreds of thorns are already in your finger. It's pretty difficult to get rid of them and the needles cause unpleasant, painful sensations. But the coolest thing about this cactus is the way it reproduces. The plant clones itself in a new place. When animals and people pass the jumping choya and touch it, the cactus gives them a small piece of itself along with the needles. As soon as you throw this piece to the ground, it takes root and starts growing. The degree of danger is rising. The next monster from the desert is running toward us, and that is an ostrich. Many think these animals are cowards hiding their heads in the sand. You will most likely change your mind if you're unlucky enough to meet one. Usually, ostriches are not aggressive, but you should run if you come closer to their nest. On the other hand, you won't be able to do that because ostriches move at a speed of 43 miles per hour. You need a car to get away from them. They run and hit their enemy with their chests. There have been cases when ostriches attacked vans and caused significant damage to them. But the main danger these birds present is their powerful legs with sharp claws. They can deliver strong blows with them and even beat a prone opponent. So, yes, if you see an ostrich in the distance, go the other way. This small spotted lizard lives underground almost all the time in the arid deserts of the southwestern U.S. and northwestern Mexico. Sometimes, it goes outside to find lunch. It only seems cute, but in fact, it's a dangerous gila monster. Its thick skin protects the reptile from hawks, coyotes, and other predators. But its main protection is its venom. Snakes and spiders inject their toxins using long, needle-like fangs. The gila monster clamps down and chews the prey to spread the venom. And when it bites a person, it can keep its jaws closed for a long time. Getting rid of the animal is a tricky feat. People who have experienced the effects of the venom say it feels as if hot magma passes through the veins. Despite this, the lizard turned out to be useful for science. Doctors used its venom to create medicines for diabetes and obesity. The time has come. Now you're about to meet one of the creepiest creatures living in the desert. Be quiet and listen to the silence. Stand still. There's no one around. Suddenly, you hear some hissing coming from below. You lower your head and see it. A big yellow spider the size of a human palm with strong jaws and long legs hides in the shadow of your body. In horror, you run away from this monster, but it goes after you. It isn't easy to do it in this situation, but try to calm down. The creature isn't interested in you. It wants only your shadow to hide from the scorching sun. Anyway, it's better not to touch it. The powerful jaws of the camel spider can cause unpleasant sensations, to put it mildly. And, by the way, this creature isn't really a spider. Yeah, it belongs to the class of arachnids, 
but it's a separate species, Salpicid. It likes to bite. It's fearless and pretty aggressive. The spider preys on insects, lizards, rodents, and small birds. It can also move at a speed of 10 miles per hour. For their small size, this is very fast. You need to be a professional athlete to run away from it. Most often, you can find camel spiders in the deserts of the Middle East, but they also live in Mexico and the southwestern U.S. These runners are nocturnal and try to avoid the sun during the day, so they are always hunting your shadow. By the way, they got their name because they often hide in the shadows of camels. You won't hide from them during the day, but they will also want to come after you at night, especially if you make a fire. Solpugids always run to the light in the hope of eating something. Some species of these spiders make a hissing sound to scare their enemies away. Now, let's calm down for a second and leave the hot desert. We're going into the humid tropics of Tanzania. Under tree bark, fallen leaves, and in dark caves, you can meet one of the most terrifying creatures on Earth, a tailless whip scorpion. Imagine a big scorpion without a tail with a flat body that looks like it has been pressed by something. It's similar to spiders, but has no venom glands and can't spin a web. This monster is silent and fast, but the scariest thing is its two front claws, twice as long as the creature itself. Any prey it catches will never escape. Life in a dark cave has spoiled its eyesight, so the whip scorpion tries to avoid sunlight. During molting, it climbs up to the ceiling and slowly comes out of its old skin. Imagine directing your flashlight there and seeing small cocoons out of which pale spiders with excessively long legs crawl. If you really meet it, be calm and slowly go away as far as possible. Be careful. The flat scorpion can crawl under your clothes in a second and bite you in the stomach. And that's not the worst part. Okay, this is a joke. This pretty guy is one of the shyest and most harmless creatures among spiders and scorpions. It's afraid of you and will never attack. Many consider it beautiful and keep whip scorpions in glass terrariums. If you want such a pet, carefully watch it so that it doesn't run away from its house. If it happens, it will be pretty challenging to catch it again. In a matter of moments, it can get under your bed or go through gaps in the floor. Then it'll go to your neighbor's apartment through a ventilation system and scare people there. Okay, how about one more scorpion? It's not as creepy as the other creatures in this video, but it's the most venomous scorpion in the USA. This is the Arizona bark scorpion. The problem is that you can see it in the desert, in your home, or in the yard. These dangerous venomous beasts crawl into rooms and often sting people. One time is enough to cause pain, similar to a bee sting. But someone with an allergy may experience paralysis, breathing problems, and other health issues. You find yourself in Africa, land of unique wildlife, home to a great variety of cultures and languages, and, first and foremost, host to the world's largest hot desert, the Sahara. It's daytime, and you are thirsty for some water and shade. You've been walking for days, trying to find one of those precious-looking oases. You feel you're near, but the horizon just keeps stretching and stretching. Your mind is tired, and your body is feeling all the heat. It's like you've eaten a full plate of hot pepper and then some more, judging by how much you're sweating. And when I say hot, think 100 degrees Fahrenheit hot, on average. No wonder this is happening. After all, you find yourself in the world's biggest hot desert. Now, I say hot desert since the biggest deserted landscapes are actually the cold ones, located in Antarctica and the Arctic. I see Antarctica's frozen desert is more or less the size of 1 million LAXs. Yep, the Los Angeles International Airport. The Arctic desert is just a bit smaller than that. Now, in case you don't know, the Sahara Desert is located in northern Africa, stretching from the Atlantic Ocean all the way over to the Red Sea. It occupies an area large enough to place approximately 100,000 Disney World theme parks side by side. According to scientists, its boundaries are expanding. Deserts usually form in the subtropics because of what's called Hadley circulation. 
the air rises at the equator and descends into the subtropics. This circulation of air has a drying effect, which helps the formation of desert landscapes. Since the 1920s, the Sahara is considered to have expanded by over 10%. How is this happening? Well, let's start from the beginning. You probably know the Sahara Desert as one of the most inhospitable places on Earth today. Just FYI, for a place to be considered a desert, it has to receive less than 4 inches of rain per year. Due to the very small precipitation index, deserts are usually dry and arid places. There is little humidity in the air, and daytime temperatures can go as high as 130 degrees Fahrenheit. Usually, there isn't that much animal and plant life because of the lack of water. But in the Sahara's case, it wasn't always like that. It may be difficult to imagine northern Africa without the tons of sand it has today. But about 20,000 years ago, the Sahara was actually one big oasis. Recent discoveries show clear evidence of what the scientists now call the Green Sahara. In the mid-1800s, a German explorer crossing the Sahara encountered some paintings and engravings that nomad artists had left behind. What he saw in those paintings looked nothing like his actual surroundings. Instead of an arid landscape with only camels and desert vegetation, the rock paintings depicted jungle animals like giraffes and hippos. There were even images of livestock and grazing animals such as cattle and sheep, something that seems impossible for modern-day Sahara. Artists usually draw what they see around them, so this finding really intrigued the German explorer. The drawings were so detailed that the artists must have had close contact with those animals. You can find this rock art spread out in the northern part of the African continent, from Western Sahara to Saudi Arabia. Geologists soon took a keen interest in this and found the first clues to what this could mean. They have been able to confirm that, in fact, northern Africa was once much wetter. They found evidence from nearby deep-sea sediment off the coast of Mauritania. Sampled cores of underwater sand and mud, known as Saharan dust flux, show geologists that, indeed, a green Sahara was possible. The more dust is blowing off of the desert and into the bottom of the ocean, the drier the climate in the region. The sediment cores show that there was much less dust, only half as much, coming off northern Africa during the humid period. This period has to do with Earth's natural cycles. Normally, the Earth rotates at a tilt of 23.5 degrees. But this angle is not consistent and changes over time. Earth's tilt is responsible for the amount of sunlight each hemisphere receives. It affects several ecosystem functions on the planet. During the time of the Green Sahara, the Earth received between 4 and 8% more sunlight than it does today. So when the Earth tilted about 20,000 years ago, the northern hemisphere received more direct sunlight, which affected humidity levels in the region. As the northern hemisphere got warmer, this affected monsoon activity. More specifically, the West African monsoon. Monsoons are wind systems that affect a region's rainfall index and humidity levels. As a part of the globe gets warmer, it allows for more air to rise. It combines with the wind to draw moisture up into the atmosphere. Little by little, northern Africa also became wetter. The increased moisture made the Sahara so wet that there were actual bodies of water in the region. As vegetation grew, the plants held on to moisture better than bare sand could. There is evidence of natural basins throughout the Sahara and lakes so big they would fit all of the U.S.'s Great Lakes inside of them. Archaeologists uncovered evidence of vibrant societies in what are now arid areas. It looks like ancient cultures were able to take full advantage of the African humid period. According to researchers, the human population peaked across the Sahara about 9,000 years ago. There are traces of fireplaces, hunting tools, fish hooks, and even mounds of fish bones. Records show that there have been over 230 green periods over the span of 8 million years. Solar radiation is always changing due to natural orbital cycles. That's why Earth will most certainly see another green Sahara moment. It might be thousands of years from now, but it will happen. The same way the Sahara turns green, it turns yellow again. Let's put it like that. All it takes is a significant axial tilt and a few years of readjusting. However, another phenomenon is calling the attention of scientists now. Recent studies by the National Science Foundation from the University of Maryland show the Sahara has expanded 10% over the past 90 years. 
This phenomenon is called desertification, which literally means fertile land turning into desert land. The Sahara Desert is now advancing into the semi-arid region of Sahel. In 1950, this region was home to 31 million people. Today, its population is over 100 million people. This rapid population growth has largely contributed to the Sahara's expansion. Farmers that were once nomads began settling down. Land usage grew more intense, aiding in weakening the soil. The demand for food has caused an overcropping of the land, so even more of it is turning into the desert now. The study also shows that natural climate cycles can affect rainfall in the Sahara and the Sahel. Scientists affirm that all deserts fluctuate, not only the Sahara. A desert's boundary may expand in the dry winter and contract during the wetter summer. South of the Sahara lies the Chad Basin. It is a natural body of water that now serves as an indicator of the Sahara's expansion. The Chad Basin is located in the region where the Sahara is advancing southward. An atmospheric and ocean expert from the University of Maryland explains that rainfall has reduced greatly in the entire region. Due to reduced rainfalls, there is less water across the entire basin, and even Chad Lake is drying out. Just like the Sahara, the Atacama Desert in Chile, deemed the world's driest, is also expanding. It is located north of the city of Santiago, and its southern border is expanding toward the Chilean capital. Because the climate is getting drier and drier here, the city of Santiago is turning into an arid or semi-arid region itself. The once fertile valleys of local rivers that lived on agriculture and livestock for many generations are losing their revenues as Chilean land is turning into a desert. Since 2010, Santiago has received only a third of its annual rainfall. Outside of the city, farmers are digging holes in search of blue gold, or simply put, water. The situation here is very similar to that of Sahel. So tell me this. Were you as surprised as I was to find out what has been happening in the Sahara region? Feel free to share in the comments below. Doggerland? No, it's not a country of dogs, as you probably first thought. It's a land the size of Great Britain in the north of Europe. But don't bother trying to find it on the map of the old continent. Your search will come back empty. Doggerland hasn't existed for thousands of years. But where was it exactly? And did humans live here? Scientists are doing their best to answer these questions. Let's start with the name. In the 1990s, a British archaeologist named the area Doggerland after Dogger Bank, a sandbank some 60 miles off the east coast of England. The word probably comes from Dutch. It was used for a fishing boat with two masts. Makes sense, since today, the North Sea is a rich fishing area. But thousands of years ago, people living here had a different diet. Some 12,000 years ago, the last major ice age was slowly reaching its end. Doggerland didn't feature seawater, but marshlands, lagoons, forests, and gently sloping hills. At that time, Britain and Ireland weren't islands. They sat deep inland. You could set off in Denmark and walk all the way to the north of Scotland. There was a system of rivers that emptied themselves in the North Sea. Back then, it was more of a channel that separated Doggerland from Norway. The rivers were different too. The Thames flowed into the Rhine. The ancient river they formed flowed into the place of today's English Channel and emptied itself into the Atlantic Ocean. Doggerland even featured a lake. There were some glaciers as well, but the land was still inhabitable. So who lived there? There were communities of hunter-gatherers from the Middle Stone Age. This was the time of human history when our ancestors mastered chipped stone tools. They used these stones with sharp edges for spears and arrowheads. This came in handy at Doggerland, which was the richest hunting area in all of Europe. It could have easily been the most populated region in the northwestern part of the continent. The hunter's prey likely consisted of reindeer, mammoths, oxen, wild pigs, brown bears, wolves, and many other species. In short, nobody went hungry here. Meat wasn't the only thing. Ancient residents of Doggerland collected hazelnuts and berries. They lived in wooden huts. They built them close to rivers, and they even constructed their settlements on hills. Remember Dogger Bank? 
it now sits underwater, but it used to be a mountainous region. Doggerland must have been prime real estate in prehistoric times. Its total surface area was over 18,000 miles, but things were about to go under, literally. The last ice age was ending. All the water trapped in glaciers and ice sheets started to melt. You experience this process firsthand every time you order a cold drink. Even if you drink it bottoms up, after a while, the glass is full again. Why? Because the ice cubes have melted. Think of Doggerland as that glass. The sea level started rising quickly. Every century, the sea flooded from three to six feet of dry land. Just imagine what this would mean today. Miami's elevation is just over six feet. The city would be flooded in less than a hundred years. But there was one event that speeded things up. The Storegas slides were a series of submarine landslides in the Norwegian Sea thousands of years ago. And what happens when huge chunks of Earth shift suddenly underwater? Gigantic waves. You probably know what a tsunami is. Doggerland was likely pounded by several of them. They were so powerful that researchers believe they washed away Great Britain's land bridge to the rest of the continent. All that was left of Doggerland was an island the size of Wales. Scientists estimate that the waves of this ancient tsunami were at least 40 feet high. Some 6,000 years ago, Doggerlanders were on the move. They were migrating to higher grounds, England and the Netherlands in their case. The ironic part is that when we literally translate the name of the country of Netherlands into English, we get lower lands. But thousands of years ago, this was higher ground for hunter-gatherers escaping the flood. Once it was all over, the continent of Europe got the shape we easily recognize today. But Doggerland was nowhere to be seen. It's been sitting under the waves of the North Sea for 8,200 years. Does the idea of Doggerland remind you of a more famous case of a submerged land? The lost city of Atlantis comes straight to mind. But there is an important difference. Atlantis is only a legend. Everything we know about it comes from the writings of the Greek philosopher Plato. Scientists have been searching for Atlantis for a long time. And up to this day, they can't even agree where exactly it was. Theories range from the Mediterranean to even Antarctica. Doggerland is not a myth. Everything science knows about this lost land comes from hard evidence. In 1931, a fishing boat was doing its thing off the coast of Norfolk in England. At the time, the crew would drag a net along the sea floor, sweeping everything in its path. And they caught something more than fish. It was peat. Like the stuff we find in Alaska and in Ireland. But what was it doing at the bottom of the North Sea? It didn't belong there, because seawater destroys peat. There was only one possible explanation. The area must have been dry land at some point in history. The final proof was that the peat contained a harpoon spear point, a sure sign of human activity. The idea wasn't new, though. Since the Middle Ages, there has been talk of submerged land with underwater forests. In 1913, a British geologist came forward with the idea of an undersea world in this part of Europe. Scientific evidence kept piling up. Local fishermen started pulling out human-made tools and animal bones. Researchers dated them to be around 9,000 years old. But the deep, murky waters of the North Sea made it impossible to send down divers. One archaeologist noted that they knew more about the surface of the moon than what lay at the bottom of this relatively shallow sea. The discovery of oil in the area in the 1960s was a real game changer. Companies from the industry provided seismic survey data to scientists. This helped them piece together the full image of what Doggerland used to look like. Computer models soon produced images of river valleys, coastlines, freshwater lakes, and hills. There are even footprints of nomadic tribes preserved on the sea floor. Today, marine biologists are using magnetic fields to map out this lost underwater world. But Doggerland isn't the only place on Earth that went under the waves. 
Beringia is another lost world of global importance. This used to be a land bridge between Asia and North America. It got its name from the Bering Strait. It is 53 miles wide at its narrowest point. But until the end of the last ice age, this was dry land that our human ancestors called home. Genetic evidence shows that Native Americans lived in Beringia for some 15,000 years. If you want to imagine what this land looked like, think of present-day Arctic Alaska. It was a shrub tundra. There were also small willows and birches. Sorry, no woolly mammoths. Large grazing animals simply wouldn't have had enough food in Beringia, though there were probably elk and bighorn sheep in the area. But the Ice Age wouldn't last forever. Like in Doggerland, sea levels started to rise. This happened some 13,000 years ago. It wasn't all bad news, though. Scientific evidence suggests that around this time, people started moving south. They left the slowly sinking Beringia and crossed over into Alaska. From there, they populated both Americas. These were the ancestors of Native American tribes. Welcome to Starbuck Island in the middle of the Pacific near French Polynesia. Even if the name brings to mind a strong coffee smell, you will find no Frappuccino there. The island is uninhabited. It's also pretty tiny, just five and a half miles east to west and about two miles north to south. The island is so small, New York City could fit in 18 such islands. Seems like there can be zero interesting things, but Google Maps have something to surprise you. A couple of months ago, there was a viral TikTok video about a weird saucer-shaped object found on Google Maps on Starbuck Island. The video racked up over 5 million views in two days. The creepiest part is that there's a long streak traversing almost the whole island. It looks as if someone had to break with all their might but failed, and it resulted in a crash of that saucer-looking vehicle. Could that be another possible proof that we aren't alone in the universe and someone tried to visit us and couldn't drive very well? All these speculations are blood-chilling, and the users believe no one knew the true story behind those traces and the saucer. Little did they know that back in 2009, a group of explorers visited the deserted island. They made a couple of videos that were uploaded to the net. Thing is, the island didn't used to be that deserted. In the 19th century, Starbuck Island was used for guano mining. A tiny clarification here, guano is bird and bat droppings. Yeah, droppings mining doesn't sound quite convincing. But guano is rich in phosphates, and phosphates have a lot of uses and can be used as fertilizers. So, since there were some people on that island, they had to construct a sort of temporary settlement, which they did. Now, back to Google Maps. Do you see that angle? Right. The satellite picture can be compared to the pictures and videos made in 2009 by the explorers. Another point proving that this weird object has a terrestrial origin is that there are some trees on the island, which is bizarre. These trees aren't native to coral limestone terrain, and they were definitely planted by people. Mystery solved! The saucer-shaped object is not an extraterrestrial vehicle, but what remains from a settlement. And the traces stretched out across the island? Eh, who knows? But it's definitely nothing out of this world. Another TikTok user claimed they saw zombies on Google Maps. Let's see if this one is true. First off, the video scared over a million people who watched it. This TikTok starts with a view from afar, and as the user zooms in, we understand we're in Finland. Then we see an inscription. Uh, all right, I surrender. Finnish viewers, help me out here. The next thing we see is a low-quality Google Street View image, and that shot sends shivers down my spine. It looks like a mass gathering of people, but they don't look quite alive. The image looks foggy and bewildering. Are these real zombies? Sure thing they're not. First off, let's deal with the inscription. It translates to English as a quiet people spatial artwork by this person. So, he is a Finnish dancer and choreographer and intended the silent people artwork to be part of his performance. But now it's an independent art piece. Fun fact, the silent people figures get changed twice a year, in the fall and at the beginning of the summer. They get all the clothes from donations. Bang! Another myth debunked. 
Bright Side 2, TikTok Myths Zero. Right, now take a look at that pic. Anything weird you've noticed? Right, it's a three-legged girl. The satellite picture was taken in Croatia. But there's nothing to worry about. These are nothing but Google Maps issues. Thing is, the technology used for Google Maps purposes has a curious algorithm. Each object gets photographed several times, and then the resulting photos are stitched together to achieve the most accurate image. In most cases, it works, but sometimes it seems like the technology tries too hard, and it results in extra details and sometimes extra limbs people have in the photo. And if we're going to have a three-legged race, then I'd bet on her. There's nothing that can escape the all-seeing satellite eye, right? On September 20th, 2022, a TikTok user posted a video about a plane found underwater on Google Earth app. The plane was found off the coast of Crooked Island in the Bahamas, not far away from Colonel Hill Airport. Now, let's see if that's true. The first thing we should keep in mind is that even Google Earth help themselves admit the fact that the pic found in the app may be the result of several photos, either satellite or aerial, taken on different days and even in different months. The result of stitching might sometimes be a bit unpredictable. Remember the three-legged girl? How could we forget? So, as you may have already guessed, this photo is nothing but stitching. The area with that plane was photographed multiple times in 2004 and 2005, then it was photographed 8 times in 2015 and a couple of times later. The most probable reason for this photo being on Google Earth is that these are the 2015 shots combined together. They say the reticulated python is the largest snake in the world and can reach a whopping 20 feet in length. There's a record of one such python found in 1912 that reached 32 feet in length. However, users found an even more staggering snake on Google Earth. On March 24th, 2022, another mind-blowing video was posted on TikTok. The video got over 200,000 likes. Imagine the views! This time, the user claimed that a mega-skeleton of the extinct Titanoboa was found on Google Maps somewhere in France. It was hard to judge from the image, but the skeleton was estimated to be about 100 feet long and could have certainly been the longest snake that ever existed, if the snakes had had such a skeleton in reality. So it's the number one reason why this one is not a snake. You see, snakes have somewhat thinner ribs, and the skeleton in the picture looks way more massive. Another curious thing about this skeleton is that it turned out to be made of steel. See what I'm driving at? It's not a real skeleton, but a stunning 425-foot-long art installation. It's called this French name, which means ocean snake in French. The installation was created by a Chinese artist, Huang Yongping, and it's free to visit. The cool thing about this installation is that it only appears with tides, so it looks like a real archaeological excavation. Well, the artist made a monkey out of millions of users. If you ever travel to France, you can go check this extraordinary piece of art. It's located in this place, not far away from that place. Sometimes, Google Maps show something that never existed. Meet Sandy Island. For a long time, it was believed to be located near New Caledonia in the Eastern Coral Sea. It all started when Captain James Cook included it in the charts back in 1774. He never visited it, but it was later included in several more charts as a precaution against reefs. At the time, it was standard practice. Plus, the area was, and is still, swarming with pumice sea rats. These are the masses left after an underwater volcanic eruption, so such a precaution was a necessity. This way, the island stayed in the charts until 1974. A flying recognition campaign claimed there was a lack of appearance of that island and Sandy Island was deleted from the charts. Google Maps appeared back in 2005, and the island, surprisingly, was there, even though it had been previously undiscovered. It got removed from Google Maps only in November of 2012. Now, there is nothing but black pixels, but there used to be a darkened sea area. Today, some specialists believe the whole situation with the island was just a copyright trap which was a popular practice among cartographers back in the day. Those traps help cartographers protect their intellectual property. So, have you ever seen anything weird on Google Maps?